So uh, we will start from the top and see what happens. So here we go. Dear Azan, regarding the vineyard rules, does one need to keep all of them to the letter or in principle is good enough? I met a monk of more than 15 years who said it's 100% or nothing. He disrobed. <laughs> he disrobed because he wanted to live uh, in seclusion in forest in Germany and need to cook himself. <laughs> Isn't it better for him to keep the robes and break the non-cooking rule? Also, some very senior monks become uh, Samanera to facilitate okay. teaching and traveling uh, in Western countries. How does it work? Uh, yeah, I think that is really, um, really silly. Uh, uh, the, uh, the point, if you disrobe because you, <laughs> you want to cook for yourself or whatever, is kind of the, the whole point of being a monk, is that this gives you the best possible way to uh, practice the path and to achieve the results of the path. That's the whole point of it. Uh, and if you disrobe, you're reducing your chances rather than increasing them. Uh, and uh, the idea that you cannot live in seclusion uh, and keep all the rules, that's kind of nonsense. Of course you can live in seclusion. Uh, there are lots of good monasteries around the world. Uh, uh, if you go to Sri Lanka, there are some great forest monasteries. Uh, and you can certainly live in great seclusion there. Uh, um, you can live at, even at Bodhinyana Monastery, you can have a very high degree of seclusion if you want to. Mm -hmm. Some of the kutis are really separate and really far away. Uh, and so I think this is the wrong way of thinking about it. I think there probably are some other underlying reasons why they disrobe uh, and not actually the, um, uh, because they you know, want to live in seclusion or they want to facilitate teaching. And this is nonsense. I come here every year, teaching very easy, no problem. Yeah, facilitate it. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, it's not a problem if you get, and it's also the idea that you want to go around teaching without being invited is also, I think, a dangerous idea. If you're going to teach, wait till you are invited, because then you know that people are interested in hearing your teachings. So, but if you travel and say, listen, I'm going to teach you, and it's always a bit dodgy, yeah, because, you know, you kind of, you want to ensure that you actually are wanted. That's kind of the whole point of these sort of things. So, so I... Uh, so I think this is a bad idea. So how strictly does one need to keep the rules? You should keep the rules quite strictly, but it's also important to understand the difference between uh, uh, what you might call, uh, there are some rules that are specifically only broken if you breach them out of this respect. Uh, like the small rules that have to do with etiquette. Yeah, if you don't, if you breach an etiquette rule because you think it doesn't, fit the modern context, that's perfectly okay, because you're not doing it out of disrespect. These are called the Seikia rules. And so for an example, a very typical example is if you are giving a talk to in a, in a lecture theater, yeah, you would normally stand as a speaker, everyone else sits down. And of course that's okay, because that's kind of the mod, nothing disrespectful in that. That was this disrespectful in ancient India, but it is no longer disrespectful in the modern world. So these are rules that you keep if it is appropriate, yeah, if it is kind of the right thing to do in, the, uh, in this culture. Uh, and there are other rules that uh, have more to do with, again, decorum and with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, beliefs. And, you, you know, you, you keep them, uh, but you also kind of know the limits of when, when it is useful to keep them. For example, uh, things like, uh, you know, cutting down a tree, you know, cutting down trees is not allowed. Uh, from a monast for a monastic, yeah. but if someone is about to die because you don't cut down the tree, then of course you cut down the tree, yeah, if you are trapped under a tree or something. So you know the limits of these rules. You don't become completely stupid just because of the, these rules. Uh, you keep your common sense, and that's really important for these things. Uh, so uh, I, I must admit, I don't sound, this doesn't sound very persuasive to me, what I'm hearing, hearing here. Uh, and uh, I think most people should be able to keep those rules uh, uh, fairly well, actually. Yeah. Any comeback on that one? Anyone want to add anything on that particular question? Uh, happy? Happy, happy? Yeah? Okay. Mm. Okay, let's move on to the uh, next one. You're very welcome to, if you don't feel that I say it appropriately, if someone wants to add another question, please grab the microphone and kind of, you know, add a follow-up if you want to. You're very welcome to do that. So. Dear Arjan, would you consider suttas for lay people like Sigalovada Sutta in future for Sutta retreat? Absolutely. 
Bob, you don't want to write down the single Avada Sutta? That's it. You have this, you're keeping this list now of <laughs> things for future retreats. Uh, Diga Nikaya number 31, is that right? Uh, yeah, 31, I think it is. Okay. So, uh, but another possibility for future retreats. Uh, Dean Ajahn, would you recommend to practice certain recollection depending on one different time of the day, e.g. before start of the day when the mind is clear and fresh, uh, to emotional state if feeling low and worrisome, for example? Uh, um, yes, this is a good point, that um, it is good to adjust to how you, what recollection you do depending on how you feel, absolutely. Uh, so, for example, if you are angry with somebody, then you do a different uh, thing from when you have uh, some desire or if you feel low, a little bit kind of lacking in energy. So, if, if you feel low and lacking in energy, then, of course, you do the positive recollections, yeah? The things that bring energy to the mind and bring joy to the mind. Uh, this is kind of the idea here. So, uh, you know, all the things we have been talking about now. Early in the day when the mind is clear, it's good to do some recollection which gives you a bit of insight, a bit of understanding. Like death contemplation is great at the beginning of the day because you, your mind is strong. It will be able to do that well and then you will carry that recollection throughout the day and it will be then a guide throughout the day in doing the right thing. So that's what you can do at the beginning of the day. Or at the beginning of the day you can also do some a samatha meditation, yeah, to calm you down when your mind is fresh. That is maybe when you will be able to do any kind of calming meditation, watching the breath, metta meditation, such things uh, is good at the beginning of the day. Also, at the end of the day, it's also good to do a bit of metta because then you will sleep much better if you have some metta at the end of the day. Read a couple of verses in the Dhammapada to inspire you, send a bit of metta to the whole world, and then sleep really nicely afterwards. Uh, Wake up in the morning, energized, ready for the next day. Yeah. That's kind of the idea here. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. When I say something like that, it means that there is no final answer. It's just, you know, this is just a suggestion. That's what something like that means. Yeah. <laughs> Aja, between Sutta study and Abhidhamma, ah, okay. <laughs> How can one learn and differentiate which to study to acquire Buddhist teachings in a salient way or appropriately, Sadhu? So, um, I, I, <laughs> I would really recommend you to stay with the suttas. I don't really know why there is so much Abhidhamma study in the Buddhist world. Well, actually, I know why. The reason is because uh, there are certain corners of the Buddhist world. They will say the Abhidhamma, this is the highest teaching of the Buddha. Yeah, the Abhidhamma is like the ultimate teachings, and the suttas are only like the temporary or conventional teachings. Uh, but actually, it's the other way around. The suttas are the ultimate teaching. Yeah. The Abhidhamma is like a commentary on the suttas. Uh, the suttas are primary, Abhidhamma are secondary. Yeah. So you can read the Abhidhamma if you want to. I find it incredibly boring. I don't know why anyone wants to study Abhidhamma. I kind of 52 Chittasikas and nine, what is it, 96 Chittas. I, can, I have no idea what the numbers are, but something like that. And then the, all these lists and all these things going on. You know, it's, it's just, it doesn't have any joy to it. It, it lacks this whole kind of uplift. It's more like a kind of a, uh, it's, it's more like a, um, uh, catalog of things, yeah, it's like looking up the telephone catalog or something like that. It has a large number of numbers and kind of sequences and things to it, but there's nothing very inspiring in the Abhidhamma. Uh, and so uh, I would say stick to the suttas. You don't need the Abhidhamma. The suttas are complete in their own right, yeah. Sometimes the Abhidhamma can function a bit like a commentary, and perhaps you can add a few things. Sometime in my mind, to my mind, the Abhidhamma gets it wrong. Yeah, it is uh, spoken after the time of the Buddha and by anonymous people. And you can expect that sometimes it will be wrong. It will not be right. It will not be understanding the word of the Buddha properly. But there is plenty of suttas. Yeah, it's probably a lifetime of study just in the suttas. And every time you read the suttas, they look a bit differently. I was really happy now to read the Kakachupama Sutta. I haven't read it for a long time. And I really enjoyed reading it, actually. And I thought, wow, this is, looks different from last time. And it was actually really, really nice. And I, even though I read it, I don't know how many times before, I still enjoy it one more time because it brings back some uh, deeper understanding of what is going on. 
So I think it's better to read the suttas, each sutta ten times before you go to the Abhidhamma. Yeah? And then go to the Abhidhamma after ten times. But not, not before ten times. It means you never get to the Abhidhamma. Um, so this is what I would uh, personally would recommend. And uh, there is too much of this uh, Abhidhamma hype in the world. Uh, anyone want to ask any more about that one? Uh, yes, uh, which one? Uh, <laughs> which one disagrees with me? Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Actually, I agree with you, Ajahn. Yeah. Just that, um, you, you, I mean, I'm not sure whether we have the luxury to say, uh, I do not want to know Abhidhamma by choice, right? So if you go to some monasteries in yeah. Malaysia, whether you like it or not, you have to learn it, right? <laughs> yeah. So let's say if you if you make yourself known that you do not want to know about Abhidhamma, yeah. Uh, there, there will be some problems, right? Mm. I mean, the most serious part is that, I mean, um, the, the lowest consequences is that um, the teacher may, I don't know, poke fun at you. But this is, I mean, but if you are very, how to say, you you are very uh, firm on your stance, right? Yeah. It may cause clash with others. Yeah. So um, sure. what's your opinion on this matter? Yeah, I think I would say that... Uh, Ordain in a place where you don't have to study the Abhidhamma, that's probably my first thing. Yeah. Uh, but if, the, if there is no choice and it is still a good monastery because the monks are good, then okay. Sometimes you're right, you have to go with what is there. You can't just stand your ground all the time because it just creates too much conflict. So if you do decide to, to ordain in such a monastery because many other things are good, then, then you do it. Then you have to accept the fact that you have to learn Abhidhamma in that case. So. But uh, remember, you know, when you do that, always remember that the sutta is a primary. Huh? Don't read the suttas through the filter of the Abhidhamma. Read the Abhidhamma through the filter of the suttas. Uh, suttas come first, Abhidhamma is secondary. Huh? So in that case, you should be, should be all right. Uh, but I agree. Because, I mean, when you ordain, you are a guest, right? Uh, and when you are a guest in a country or in any place, you have to behave like a guest. You can't really behave like you own the place. Uh, and so you have, to, uh, you have to be sensitive. So, Yep. Uh, Ajahn, I have a comment. I learned this ah. from two very learned teachers. Okay. One has passed away, yeah. but of course, I, I don't want to mention the names because yeah. I'm just uh, reinterpreting what I heard. Yeah. Uh, that after soon after the schizism in uh, in the during the second council, yeah. uh, when the the Maha Sankika, the Maha Yana broke off, yeah. uh, and they used. They, they created the Abhidhamma or they referred to it as the teachings of the Buddha, but they used the Abhidhamma as a medium to compete with each other to see who knows more about what the Buddha was teaching in great detail. It was more like trying to see who knows more about how many types of feelings and how many types of chattasikas and all that. Okay. So it was more like a, 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 an opportunity to compete with one another. <laughs> okay. And I think that uh -huh. that kind of yeah. thing, thinking actually carried on until yeah. today. That a lot of people think that if yeah. you know a lot about Abhidhamma, you must be very knowledgeable. Right, okay. Okay, that's, in, that's an interesting point. I never heard that, that, that before actually. That's kind of fascinating. I think, yeah, that is one, one possibility. Yeah, and, and I think what happens very often is that um, Sometimes you can't meditate, maybe meditation is going very well, and then you want to find something else to do, and you want to study in more detail, and then you can end up creating the Abhidhamma. The creation of the Abhidhamma obviously came from a restless mind, yeah? So it is, I would say restlessness is the cause of the Abhidhamma, yeah? It came from restlessness. And that is a little bit like what you are saying, right? Is the idea of competing with each other. Obviously, you have lost the plot a little bit when you end up in that way. That is not what the purpose of the Dhamma is at all, yeah? And so, uh, yes, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. But the Abhidhamma is, uh, you know, quite different. There is Abhidhamma of the Sarvastivadin school, and that is still existent in Chinese translation. There's also some Abhidhamma called the Sariputra Abhidhamma, which belongs to the Dhammaguptaka school. Yeah. And these Abhidhammas are, are very different from each other. Yeah. And so we know that Abhidhamma is not the word of the Buddha. It kind of expanded and came out when the school started to separate and things like that. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you for that, Billy. That's, that's uh, in interesting. So, <laughs> okay, let's move on to the um, post a bit of my question now. <laughs> Dear Rajan, every day when I meditate, I try to practice gratitude. Yay, that's okay. That's wonderful. 
I reflect and remind myself of what I can be grateful for. Good food, good company, good career, good teachers, good shelter. Wow, you are very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, I don't feel happy or blissful. I sometimes feel embarrassed for my lack of gratitude and selfishness. What can I do to bring more joy into my life so that I can give joy to others? Thank you. Good. I, at least you are open about it, and I think you are probably not the only one. I think it's probably quite a common thing. We try to be grateful. It is not always so easy. So um, what I would do is that uh, stop, stop doing that contemplation for a while. Don't do it anymore, because if it doesn't work, there's no point in trying it. So leave it aside for a while, do other things instead, and then come back maybe in six months' time and then try again. Yeah? Because if you're just pushing something which doesn't work, it, is not really, it doesn't really have any point. So you need to have a look at your life. What are the things, where can you improve yeah, in your life, whatever it might be. Uh, look at all the factors of the path, you know, the ideas of generosity, of metta, karuna, uh, all the factors of sila on the path. Uh, uh, maybe you can do some death contemplation. I just suggest the death contemplation in the morning is a very powerful uh, anicca contemplation, the death contemplation. Uh, so look at all of these little things, uh, yeah, and then see what you can do better in your life. Uh, and then when you kind of these things fall into place, uh, wherever it might be that you feel you are lacking a little bit, uh, then down the track the gratitude may actually start to work again. Uh, it's interesting. All of these factors kind of work together, uh, and they kind of come out together, and, by, uh, uh, and, and so the gratitude may actually emerge as a consequence of practicing the other factors. And also, if you practice more generosity towards others, uh, you start to understand the beauty of generosity, and then automatically you also feel more gratitude from others as a consequence. Yeah, so have a look at your life. See uh, where you can improve, and what you can do different, and then see what happens as a consequence. Okay, dear Arjan, when I was a child, I was afraid of monks and nuns. Okay, so you're hopefully no longer afraid. <laughs> I have to admit, I was also afraid. I was an adult, I was still afraid of monks and nuns. I, I remember the first time I went to a monastery, that was in the UK. I went to some of the Ajahn Shah monasteries in the UK. It was quite scary the first time, yeah, because I didn't have, really have any exposure to Buddhism before. How old was I when I went there? I think I was 27 or something like that when I went there the first time. It was like very foreign, yeah, a, mon a monastery, kind of weird people wearing weird clothes. Oops, I guess I'm wearing those. Okay, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and with shame and heads and all kind of, the, kind of the Buddhist things on the walls and everything. Yeah, it's kind of, it is kind of scary when you're used to other things. Uh, at least you're a bit wary about it, yeah? And so uh, I can certainly understand that. Uh, anyway, people always tell me that I have to behave around them and they can read minds. This makes me fearful. Yes, so sometimes they, um, that's the problem, right? You, they can read minds. Well, maybe a tiny, 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 tiny minority, 0.00001% can read minds, like one person. It's very, very rare that anyone can actually read minds. It depends what you mean by reading minds, yeah? Because you can look at someone and you can know that they are tired, for example, if their head is nodding, yeah? So that's, that's, that's one, one, one way of reading minds, yeah? <laughs> I'm being very naughty. But you can, you can also you can, you know roughly what's going on in people's minds by knowing their expressions, yeah? how they're behaving how they are. So this is actually is one way of reading minds. So, and then there's more the full reading of minds when you actually read the thoughts and these kind of things. So a slightly different thing here. Yeah. But it's very rare for anyone to read minds directly. Yeah. Anyway, so I can understand if you're a child and people tell you these things, of course you get worried. Yeah. Now I'm older and met with more monks and nuns who are friendly. I understand my fear in childhood is not true. But maybe due to habits of years of conditioning, whenever I see Sangha members, I still have automatic fear inside, although I know I shouldn't. What is your advice? How should I remove the inner and automatic fear due to past conditioning? Or should I meditate and contemplate on this? Um, the best way is to become a monk or nun. 
Yeah. <laughs> then you will definitely remove all fear. I can, I can absolutely guarantee that. But uh, in, uh, in the meantime, remember that monks and nuns who practice well, someone like Ajahn Brahm, yeah, they are just really, really kind people. It doesn't matter what you do, you will always have kindness to you. Even if you go and shout at Ajahn Brahm in his face, uh, he will just look at you with compassion and wonder, what are you doing? Why are you doing this for her? Yeah, it's not a good idea. Please don't. <laughs> but he, he will never get angry with you, regardless of what you do. Yeah, I have been around Ajahn Brahm for 30 years. And so you just have to sometimes just have to trust that uh, there's something uh, nice going on there, something, uh, something wholesome. And uh, it's very, it's not that hard to see if you look carefully like someone like Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, it's not dangerous. I don't think I'm all that dangerous either, to be honest. But. Uh, <laughs> And so you, uh, you just look at things in a different way. And uh, all of these things that you, you know, you don't even have to behave around Ajahn Brahm. You can be completely obnoxious uh, and uh, still no problem. Still nothing will really happen uh, as a consequence. So just keep on watching and seeing what is there. And uh, you can, maybe you can test Ajahn Brahm a little bit and see what happens. Uh, and uh, with that test, you will kind of figure out very quickly that there is no Nothing there to fear. I wouldn't really recommend that. If you start testing, you might uh, might be a bit dodgy. So probably not the best way to do this. Uh, so um, yeah, just, uh, just look carefully here. Uh, yeah, see what is really there. See what actually is going on. Uh, and uh, come and stay in the monastery for a while, maybe. Yeah, you're very welcome to come and stay at uh, Bodhinyana Monastery or Damasara Monastery in Perth. Yeah, if you have the chance to go overseas, uh, or maybe some of the monasteries here. Uh, um, I don't know what the monks are like so much in Malaysia, but uh, certainly the monastery in our monasteries, the monks are usually usually nice, except for maybe the one or two grumpy ones. So watch out for those. <laughs> I'm, being, I'm being naughty again. There's always, you know, things are always a bit up and down there. So hang out for a while in the monastery. Yeah, chat, have a chat with the monks and see what happens. Uh, and after a while, they start to recognize they're just ordinary people. They're just like you. There isn't that really great difference. Uh, except maybe for some monks who are really, really well practiced and it's a bit different. Uh, so just, uh, just observe carefully here uh, and uh, you will overcome it. Uh, practice the metta, metta towards the monks, compassion towards the nuns uh, and metta and compassion in this way. Yeah? And uh, look constantly for the good qualities. And after a while, the fear will evaporate as a consequence. Uh, the fact that you're asking this question suggests to me that the fear is already on the way to disappear. That's why you're asking it. So you're already on the right track, I think. <clears throat> okay, dear Ajahn, we spoke a lot about the power of the mind. If we can develop the mind in the right way, can we be awakened? We can be awakened. Can you explain what is the mind? Thank you. What is the mind? Uh, the mind is pretty much everything. Yeah, everything, if you think about it, the mind is, um, uh, you experience the world. Yeah, that experience of the world is really the mind. Yes, you are experiencing things all the time. That experience, mind is really pretty much, largely everything that you know is really the mind in a sense. Uh, you can ask, what is matter? Now, that's much more difficult to answer because matter is somehow supposed to be external to the mind. But uh, is anything really external to the mind? Everything ultimately is an experience, uh, and experience happens in the mind. Uh, so I would go so far as to say that pretty much everything is mind. Uh, yeah, everything, because everything is your experience. Uh, and so that is what it is. So now, but then you can, of course, you can refine it down. What you can do is you can talk about the six senses, uh, and you can refine the mind down to one of those six senses. Uh, and that's what we were talking about when we were talking about the... Uh, Anapanasati Sutta, yeah, the idea that when you become very peaceful, five of the senses disappear and you're left with one sense. That is the mind sense. And very often the way that is experienced is as a, like a nimitta, a yeah, bright light or something like that. Yeah? That is the, the sixth sense. That is one way of thinking about the mind. So either you can think about the mind as everything, all experience, or in a more limited sense as the light that you see when the other senses pass away. And finally, you can say that the mind is what you experience in the deep samadhi of the jhana experiences, when the, fact, when the five senses are completely gone, yeah, and there's absolutely nothing left but the mind. 
that there's another way of thinking about mind. These are different ways of thinking about mind. So, uh, something like that. Yeah? Okay. Let us move on now. Dear Ajahn, I always wanted a close-knit relationship, but unfortunately don't have any relatives, family or friends to speak of. I know that we are all alone and find refuge unto ourselves, but it takes a long time to reach that level. How to deal with severe loneliness, which is my Achilles here. Many thanks. So, um, okay, so uh, yes, so it's very important to have some friends in life. So I would really uh, recommend you to try to reach out a little bit and see if you can build up some friendships. This is said to be one of the most important uh, causes for happiness in life, to have friends. So I would really encourage you strongly to try to develop that. Now, one of the ways of doing that is to uh, come to the BGF, yeah, take up some uh, volunteer jobs here, yeah, and learn how to kind of uh, hang out with the people here. These are really good people. And then you have some Kalyanamitas, not just friends, but you have real Kalyanamitas. Yeah? This is very, very, very useful. Uh, so come here and hang out. Uh, uh, but also at the same time, remember that sometimes the reason why sometimes we have qualities in us that maybe rub other people up the wrong way. Yeah? So also ask yourself how you can be more kind, how you can be more generous in your life. Yeah? Ask yourself how you can treat other people with more compassion and care. Almost everyone likes people who have metta. If someone has a lot of kindness, guaranteed you will be popular. Yeah? So the more kind you can be to the world around you, the more popular you will be and you will draw people to you as a consequence. Yeah? You become like a magnet to other people. After a while you have to say, please go away. Too many friends. Yeah? <laughs> I don't want so many friends. I, I, this is not what I wanted. I wanted kind of a balance. Now it's out of balance again. So be careful not to be too kind. <laughs> I'm joking. Please be too kind. Yeah? Don't try. And so this is really the way. Hang out with good people. Go to places where you can meet people like here, yeah, like-minded people. And then uh, look at yourself. How can you do better? How can you be more friendly person, kind person? And then as you do that, I can uh, gradually things will happen and you kind of get, uh, uh, get to have more friends in your life. So, but absolutely, it's something that you should do. We should value our friendships more. We should spend less time with our mobile phones and, have, and spend more time with real people. Yeah, this is such an important thing. How do you develop a real relationship? It's by I, you know, being face to face with somebody, talking to people. That's how we develop real relationships in this world. And we need more of that. And so, uh, yeah, so thank you for that question. It's a very good question. And thank you for bringing it up because I think it's, uh, we live in times when more people are lonely. So it's, it's very useful to consider. Yeah. Dear Ajahn, when I reflect on impermanence sometimes, I wonder how I can live life more fully and with joy. Sometimes I feel tired and demotivated and want to give up. Thank you. Uh, maybe reflect less on impermanence. Yeah, if that, if that kind of causes difficulties for you, reflect on other things instead. Uh, reflect on... Uh, uh, all the good things in your life, uh, reflect more on metta and compassion, uh, reflect more on uh, uh, you know, the fact that you are on the path, you're moving towards something positive. Uh, one of the great things that, about being a practicing Buddhist is that you're moving towards brightness. Uh, and if one who is practicing this path has a good future, yeah? so you have very, every reason to feel hopeful about the future if you're living well. But don't try to reflect too hard on things that uh, let you down or make you feel uh, negative. If impermanence doesn't really work for you, don't reflect on that. Uh, use something else instead. Uh, practice well. Do acts of generosity. Think of that generosity in a positive way. Yeah? Uh, learn some metta meditation. Uh, be kind to others. Uh, do acts of service. Yeah? And then reflect on those things. Uh, and then build up all the positive qualities from there. Uh, uh, know what works for you uh, and don't just try blindly to follow a certain recipe given by someone else. Uh, yeah? In the end, we have to take charge of our own spiritual life because uh, no one else can really do that for you. Uh. So 
So go to Azan. Appreciate if Azan can help to explain and expand on the following. Ajahn Brahm always tells the story of this lay person who visited Ajahn Shah, and Ajahn Shah's instruction was to just to sweep the leaves at the monastery. And just by sweeping, that lay person attained insight. Each time I sweep, <laughs> <laughs> that story pops up, and I am clueless how that lay person attained that insight and what insight he actually attained. Yeah, thank you so much. I think the story is as follows. I'm going to correct it slightly. I think the story is as follows, that he, he visited Ajahn Shah's monastery, and the instructions from Ajahn Shah was that if you sweep, give the sweeping everything you've got. I think that is the story. I don't think it, he gained necessarily much insight, but he should put everything into what you're doing. That is really the thing. And what that means is that it doesn't mean that you put necessarily a lot of effort or you try really hard. What it means, you put full attention onto what you're doing. Yeah, You do things 100%. So you give everything full attention to what you're doing now. You don't kind of scatter your attention around. If you sweep, do it properly. Do a good job. Then you feel good about it afterwards because you're doing a good job. And by feeling good about it afterwards, you are building up the good qualities inside, which eventually down the track will lead to deep meditation and insight. I don't think you can. I agree with you. I don't think sweeping will give you a heap of insight. Very unlikely. But if it does, well done. I would, <laughs> that would be marvelous if it did. It doesn't? Okay. All right. <laughs> Yeah. I was Samiri mm -hmm. in Sri Lanka. Actually, I was not Samiri yet. I was uh, Nagarika. Mm -hmm. And every morning, my duty was to, you know, to sweep yeah. the body leaves. Okay. And then there's a lot of leaves. Yeah. And every day I swept, you know, something rise in me, you know, some insight, some terms and those kind of things. Every yeah. day. And I wrote it down in a computer. Okay. But uh, later, you know, I was, I, I took a tuk tuk, from, you know, the three wheeler. Yeah. From uh, candy, from candy to the airport, and then you know, the computer didn't work anymore. Uh -huh. So I lost all of it. Really, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. All the insights gone. Yeah. Okay. It's a computer. Santi yeah. Caro gave me. All right. The old one he didn't use. So can you can you remember now what kind of insight it was? Sir? Many things, you know, yeah. Many, yeah. many things, and I wrote down every day. Was it related to the sweeping or related to other things? Sir? To other things, the other dharma things, yeah. In, yeah. In, in daily yeah. life. Right, yeah. yeah. And so, so what happens there is that you are sweeping, and because your, your mind is kind of, you're doing an easy task, which doesn't need much focus, the dhamma can kind of arise naturally while you're doing it, yeah? So it's not actually related to the sweeping, it's related just to your general contemplation of the dhamma, right? Yeah? Is that what you're saying, is it? Well, yeah, in yeah. a way, while I'm doing yeah. your sweeping, you know, yeah. my mind, it, mm. it, it just pop up, you know, things just mm. pop up every day. Yeah. And I wrote it down every day, that's yeah. a lot. So you're doing sweeping and then, meditation. And a lot of more. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. So that's that's what they call sweeping meditation, is that right? So. <laughs> it gives yeah. rise to insights. Even so. you mindful of what you're doing, you know, the mind is clear and not scared of thinking about this and that. Yeah. Then you know, yeah. naturally yeah. things arise yeah. in your mind. Yeah. It's interesting because sometimes you try to do meditation while sitting down, you try to watch the breath, and you can't really relax properly because you're trying too hard or the Breath doesn't really, you know, you can't really, you have not, not have enough distance to the breath. But then when you do sweeping, actually you can relax sometimes, yeah, because it's like a, a little bit more activity. Yeah? And uh, so you, so I think that is probably true, that sometimes you can get more insight by sweeping than by watching the breath, yeah? which is kind of fascinating, yeah, depending on the, your level of meditation, etc. of course. Yeah. Mm. Okay, good. So uh, let's go on to... Uh, Ah, I have some very good news. We're almost finished with all the questions. So I'm going to go to the very end today. So uh, only a few questions left. Uh, okay, now here we are. Uh, need not make a wish. This is a long time ago now, but anyway, I'll we'll go back to it. Uh, and Guttur Nikai 10.2. This looks like the natural process of the emergence of a Pache Pacheka Buddha. Can Adzan comment? 
Um, uh, I don't think so. I, I don't think it has anything directly to do with the Pacheka Buddha. I mean, it could be because Pacheka Buddha has also become enlightened in the same way. But it's just a general process for awakening, which is true for everyone. Yeah? Whether you are Pacheka Buddha or you are Arahant, or even if you are a Samma, Sam Buddha, still the process is the same. Yeah? The same things that you have to go th through to reach awakening. Yeah? So the um, Need Not Make a Wish Sutta is the Sutta we talked about before. That if you have virtue, then you don't need to make a wish. May I have uh, no regrets? If you have no regrets, you don't make to make a wish. May I feel joy, Pamuja. If you have joy, you don't need to make a wish. May I have rapture, rapture, tranquility, tranquility, happiness, happiness, samadhi, samadhi, seeing things according to reality, seeing things according to reality, leading to dispassion and um, repulsion. Uh, repulsion and dispassion leading to a knowledge and vision of, uh, of liberation. Uh, and uh, so I think that this is a natural process for all awakening, whether you're Pacheka Buddha, Samma Sam Buddha, Arahant, or, uh, yeah, or stream entry even. Uh. Dear Ajahn, thank you very much for uh, stringing it all together. I noticed that you encourage us to sit for a short while, uh, but quite frequently. Is this how we should meditate at home? Um, it is up to you how you meditate at home. But the reason why we do that is because uh, when there is so much teaching here, uh, it's good to just to uh, chillax in between because it just gets too much if I talk all the time. Yeah? And so we have a bit of breaks. It means people have a chance to go to the bathroom, the toilet over here. You can stretch your legs. You can even have a quick cup of tea. Yeah? And it gives us a chance to kind of not to have too much information. That is the main reason for that. Uh, and also just closing your eyes a little bit, it gives an opportunity to assimilate a bit of information as well. You can reflect on it a little bit. And then you have Q&As regularly throughout the day. So not everything happens at the end of the day. That's kind of the idea behind this. But uh, you are very welcome. I saw that Bobby had scheduled in a feedback session towards the end. So which means that uh, you have a chance to give feedback and to make suggestions for future retreats if you, if you wish. How long does it take a meditator to reach rapture? This will um, uh, vary enormously depending on the time and place and day and person, all kind of things. Sometimes it may, you never get rapture at all, regardless of how long you sit because the mind is not in the right state. At other times it can happen very quickly because the mind is in the right place. So this is kind of very, very variable. So uh, you just have to you know, do what you can and then see what happens. So. Dear Ajahn, uh, many thanks for your teachings. Uh, what are your thoughts on Maitreya Buddha? How are people predicting about him? Is it mentioned in the suttas uh, when the future Buddhas are going to arrive? Uh, my thoughts about Maitreya Buddha is that Maitreya Buddha is a myth. It's a legend about the future. And uh, is it related to reality? Well, it is re related to the reality in the sense that... Uh, uh, there are always new Buddhas coming, right? There's, there's no Buddha is just a natural phenomenon. So every now and again, a Buddha arises. But the idea of calling the Buddha Maitreya Buddha, it seems like much too much of a prediction, yeah? that actually a specific kind of Buddha. But uh, we know that there will be a Buddha. That's good enough to know. We don't know when. We don't know the name of that Buddha. We don't know where he will, this Buddha will arise. We don't know anything really about this Buddha. And uh, it is only found in one sutta in the Pali Canon. And that particular sutta, the parallel that exists in the Chinese suttas, uh, actually is not found there. So even in the Pali Canon, quite likely, it is a, a later addition to that particular sutta. So forget about Maitreya Buddha. I would not even worry about it for one second. Uh, I feel personally it is almost a little bit disrespectful when some people talk about the future Buddha when we already have the present Buddha. The present Buddha Gautama, he has given us these teachings. He has given us the gift of the Dhamma. And then we go off, my, you know, respecting a pie in the sky. Because that's what the future Buddha is, a pie in the sky. We don't know anything about the future Buddha. So uh, I would say it's, it's just silly to go around um, worshipping or respecting or revering some future Buddha that we don't know anything about. So I would say 
my my recommendation is to let it be. Yeah. Last question for today. Yeah. Stick everything back in here. Yeah. Um, Anapanasati Sutta. Can one breathe in and out, experiencing mental processes, feelings, and perception before experiencing rapture and bliss? Um, I would say that uh, the uh, so called mental processes here are precisely the rapture and bliss. That is what it is referring to. Yeah? It is a further development of that rapture and bliss. Uh, almost all the suttas have this gradualness to them. That's the whole point of the suttas. They are built up in a gradual sequence. That is how we can make sense of them. Uh, if they didn't have a gradual structure, it's very hard to make sense of things. Yeah? It becomes very random. So almost everything in the suttas have this gradual structure to them. Uh, and so for that reason, the mental phenomena, the mental experiences here, are a further development on the bliss and rapture from before. Uh, yeah, that's kind of really the idea here. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, but, but essentially it is very much the, uh, it, it's a very similar kind of thing. It refers largely to the same thing. Uh, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Does it make sense, maybe? Okay, if it makes sense or not, and we're going to stop there anyway, so. <laughs> okay, let's do some quick meditation together before we call it a day here. Yeah.